I, I know I've been called some names behind my back. Maybe to my face sometimes. Maybe to your face. Just, I was going to say, maybe to your face too. That is subtly, but I'm so oblivious to it that I'm just here doing my job. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, girl, so, I'm like, so busy being busy. Have you seen this meme that's like, if I'm not working, I'm sleeping. If I'm sleeping, I'm minding my business. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's just like, right. it's all applicable. Hey guys, this is Stephanie. This is a table for four and we're doing a new segment with sit downs with Stephanie. I have a bunch of awesome guests. I've known these ladies for half my lives. I am super excited that we have Marilyn and Maya. Marilyn is a person that I've known since I think eighth grade, even ninth grade, no ninth grade when we first met in high school. And she has been such an integral part in our lives. I mean, both Maya and Marilyn. So they have gifted me their presence to help me on my podcast to start this book club with movies and shows. So today we're going to be highlighting Women's History Month. We're going to be diving in and talking about how everybody's position as a lady, they're busy, they're owning businesses, and they're running the world, along with keeping busy (laughs) with everything else. So I just want to thank you guys for coming in today. But let's jump right in and let's talk a little bit about Marilyn. Marilyn has a BA from the University of Michigan and has a master's from Michigan State University. She is a child of an immigrant, as we all are, (laughs) from El Salvador. And I have, well, I have the pleasure of meeting her early in my life. And she has also been so integral in our lives, both myself and Maya. And her by herself. She's having a passion for traveling, reading, especially the fictional ones, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later, and especially music. As a native New Yorker, she was born and bred in Brooklyn. Brooklyn! (laughs) So I know we always had uh, a difference because she's a diehard Yankee fan and I'm a Met fan. It's fine. It's all good. And she's also a Giants fan, which is It's okay, too. But what happens is we have to all represent New York team. She also comes from a big family, which I've had the pleasure of meeting. And she's also been involved with college sports, which is also from the Wolverines. And all the way, go blue. Yay. (laughs) Marilyn, thank you for coming. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, Stephanie and Maya. I know I'm super excited to just sit down and have a chat with you. I know it feels like forever since the last time we even sat down and had a conversation. (laughs) So I just want to talk a little about Maya. Maya is another fantastic individual who has been another integral part in helping me make this podcast with you ladies today. And Maya has been a busy, busy lady for as long as I can remember. I always, her nickname was always Maya the Great. It still is. It still is. It still is. Maya has a specialty, which she's just been her own entrepreneur for the last 15 years. Having her own business and having that sense of finance and and doing all these things and being an advocate for business has always been, she's always been good with numbers. That I've always known. So... (laughs) always been good with numbers and as an advocate for diversity inclusion as well maya has always aimed to transform beautiful spaces and to create more involvement within the community so maya has been in school for i think as long as i have (laughs) or even longer girl (laughs) she's currently studying towards her doctorate of education in organizational leadership with an emphasis an emphasis in organizational development So I'm thinking maybe she can help me organize my life, but I'm pretty organized myself. I mean, I've been okay, knock on wood. So she also holds a BS in business management and finance and an MS in global business, both from Brooklyn College. 
Welcome, Maya. How are you today, girl? Hey, yeah. How are you? Hey, Marilyn. I'm keeping busy. That's how it is. So, <laughs> ladies, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you had an opportunity to come and sit down with me and have this podcast conversation. Let's jump right into it. March, it is recognizing Women's History Month. So, what we're going to just talk about, we're just going to talk about influential, beautiful women and just talk about women in general. What it is, is that we have such an integral part in how community is integrated. We are part of education. We are part of raising children. We are part of a large community. And there has been so much support in terms of empowering women. And Maya is going to be the one to kind of lead us off and tell us a little bit about her business and a little bit about her background. And you, you could just tell us everything about you because all the listeners need to know that you have been busy since day one. <laughs> yes, yes. I've been busy since day one. A, a couple of information about my businesses. I've been in the tourism industry for over 11 years. And I recently started a travel business uh, called Albrecht Passports. And it's specifically highlighting black travel and brown travel as well. And before that, my concentration has always been finance and business. So I also have a consulting agency that I help small businesses manage their funds properly. Those who are just entrepreneurs or small nonprofits, things like that, that they need just help with bookkeeping, with understanding processes, with operational work. And yeah, that's kind of a, a, a nutshell of, of what I do and who I am. It sounds like you've been... <laughs> girl. And I know you just recently moved into a, a new home and it has just been something that you've always dreamt of. I know that when you were going through the process of buying a home that you were like, girl, I'm stressed. I'm like, who is not stressed when buying a new home? It is not for the week. I tell and, you then managing, not, and then managing everything the all at the same time. Yes. It's a blessing and a curse because every other day something's broken. So. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that because the same happens over here, girl. Right. And then like, being a female, you got to be like, oh, okay, am I supposed to fix that? I'm like, as, am I supposed to call somebody for that? You know, from a renter, I'm like, oh, okay, no, no, I'm just not going to pay my rent because my landlord is going to fix that heater. And I'm like, that's not the case. Right, right. Either I'll be cold or I'll figure it out. So. <laughs> oh my God. But it's just amazing that you know, seeing just where we are now and we started from the bottom, now we're here. But no, but we're always continually growing. And Marilyn, I would love for you to dig in a little bit more and talk about how your education and you've been involved with education for the longest. So you have an amazing understanding of how that goes. Well, I guess my start in education was interesting. Coming from Brooklyn and going to move to the University of Michigan, it was an interesting introduction to the Midwest and the new part of the country. And I struggled within my first year of education and I really made it through because of my academic advisor. And that is where my passion for education came in because I really saw how how much of an impact a person can make on a, a student of color, a student from a, an urban area with underserved people like myself and being a child of immigrants. My parents didn't really have a college education. It was all very new for me. And my passion for education came from there. And I've been working with students of color, also students not of color. And it's been an interesting ride. You really get to see the difference that you make with students. They come in all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, trying, like, excited to be in college, but they're also scared because they have no idea their entire life has been planned until that moment. And then... They're thrown into the wild of you make all your decisions, you figure it out, and we're there you to go. guide them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and as scary as it is for the kids, it's scary for the parents too, because they have no idea what to do. Working in education has been interesting, it has been hard, but it's also been really fun. I have met some really great, great students and I've kept in touch with them and I've loved it the entire time. What's so crazy, like thinking back, what was your journey in college? Like my journey was a little bit different. Your journey was a little bit different. Can you just tell us a little bit, like, how was your journey, like, from the time from graduating till to the point that it's like, now, Maya, you're about to go get your doctor right now. So you've been in school for, <laughs> for as long as I for can too remember. Long. For too long. <laughs> 
Well, I think part of education is knowing yourself. And I'm lucky that I've always been able to learn about myself a bit more and be honest about who I am. And I know that if I took time off in between school, I would never go back. I know that about myself. God, that's what I happened would, to me. I would always tell myself I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Happened so to me. I had to go straight through. <laughs> Guilty girl, so guilty. I ended up, after high school, I ended up going to the University of Michigan and did my four years there. And like I said, it was a roller coaster. It was, I had a really hard time. And then I found myself about soft, sophomore year. And then I was like killing it junior, senior year, which was really, really great. And I was also working at the time too. So it was juggling a lot to try to like keep myself in college and also have some like some funds to be able to live life and then after I graduated because yeah, it ain't which, cheap <laughs> it's not cheap it's not cheap and there's many times where pizza was like everything in life um ramen and noodle. pizza is not New York pizza so no it's, it's, not. <laughs> it's, not. it's basically not. like wonder bread it's life but then I went into grad school and that really helped me figure out what I really wanted to do. Most people think when you go into a social work program, you're just going to be working with the state. But that really just helped me figure out how I can like be a counselor, but also be a guide to, to students, how to help them achieve their goals by helping them find who they are and what their passion is. A lot of times, Kids go into something that their parents want them to go into, or they see something on TV and they're like, that's what I want to do. And the moment they step into the classroom, they figure out that's not what they want. That's or not they what figure they out it's really hard. These science classes that students are taking, these math courses aren't like AP classes or anything like that. Or if you're mm-hmm. like me, who didn't even know what AP was when we were in high school because no one ever explained it to me. <laughs> Teaching them what that is, it's an interesting journey for them. And it's been really eye-opening. So at this point, oh, like sorry. when you're doing the counseling, right? Because now you have your degree in um, psychology, correct? I just want to make sure. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So from there, you've had a lot of experience in terms of mental health and in integrating coping mechanism, things like that, to help mm-hmm. them find themselves during their journey for school. So I can't even tell you how important that is just for anybody going to school. Because again, this is a whole new adventure. I mean, mm-hmm. you're out there and it's just like, hey, here you go, figure yourself out. And it's like, I'm 18. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I want. Do I want to study this? Do I want to study that? And I'm, I am a, an example of that because I didn't figure out what I wanted to do until I was like 36. So <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> Like we're I'm in school also back again, to figure it out. right? We're all still trying to figure it out. So imagine me at 36 and then an 18 year old trying to figure out what they want to do. But then that's why we mm-hmm. have you as counselors and helping them to kind of find themselves in a sense. It's like, listen, if you don't know, that's OK, too. But it's just mm-hmm. like we're here to help you. And I think that's just something so amazing that I've had the opportunity to have great counselors and have the opportunity to talk to them and say, hey, listen, you're an adult learner now, so things are a little bit different for you. So I was just mm-hmm. like, that was like a hard wake up call because mm-hmm. I didn't realize I was like, he's right. <laughs> I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm 36. I'm trying to go back to school. I'm starting all over again. But essentially, just like anything else new, it's going to be exciting, but it's very nerd wracking. But I'm very grateful that I've been having the opportunity to go to school and continue and finish towards mm-hmm. another goal that I have. But Maya, tell us a little bit more about your journey about school, because I know, girl, tell me. <laughs> well, first, let me say I'm so proud of Marilyn, because when we all, if your audience knows that we all went to high school together, right? And when we were all trying to figure out what college we was going to, Marilyn. She, was- yup, she knew immediately. Uh-huh. And we were she like, was- like yes. where are you going? <laughs> and we're like, so you're leaving us? Like, but, like, she was like, that work? And we just all thought that was just such a bad idea because you you would leave. Us, I did. Right? <laughs> I did. So we was like, Marilyn, what are you doing? And she's like, nope, this is my path. And so I was so happy. I'm so happy and proud of her because she didn't listen to shit we had to say. <laughs> <laughs> and 
she followed her heart. And I know it was a family tradition that all of her siblings went. And so I'm so happy that you did that. And you got to figure out stuff on your own because Stephanie and I, mama's girls, yes. Uh, yes. stayed home. Stayed home. <laughs> yeah. Went to a local school. And it's a different experience. We, we know we never had that off-campus life. We never had that, oh, my mom is just not right there or parents are right there to, to call or whatever. So it's a different experience when you had that away from home experience for college. And I definitely, as I'm giving advice to my siblings or my cousins or my nephews or anything like that, I'm always an advocate of go away. Like, <laughs> yes. go, go yes. away to school. Like, I mean, granted, if you get accepted into a fantastic school and this is where you want to go, then do that. Do but that. Right, away. right, right, you right. Know, find your own because that's important. So I would say my journey, right, of education, I feel like as a children of immigrants, education is just so in strain on us, like absolutely it's just important. Open your books. You better know your books better you than study. you know. <laughs> better Don't bring no less than a hundred <laughs> home. Girl, right, I know. right. And so education was so big because I feel like as immigrant, our parents wanted to make sure that we were secure enough to be able to make it here. And, and to be sufficient so on our own. Right. right. That's what they always wanted for us, for sure. Right, right, right. Because it was a struggle for them when they came over here and they had to try to find and make it. And they knew that at least you have an education here and you could get a good job and you could make it on your own. So I would say because I have West Indian parents, education was big on me and and the rest of my siblings as well. Um, going to school and going to college was just not maybe. It was, you're going here. It's like a when. It's a when. Yes. It's a right, when. Right. <laughs> right. It's a when. So I think I actually had that moment where I thought I was going to be an architect. And it was because I had a love for pre-engineering because we all was in our yep. pre-engineering program in high yep. school. And I absolutely loved it. I love the attention to detail. I love the drawings. I love that. I still have my T-square and my, the, one, in my the, attic. One for, yes, the one from shop class. I still have that somewhere down my, downstairs in my basement. But when I went to college for to, to become an architect and I got to like year two and a half, I was like, this ain't the same thing that we was doing in high school. Yep. Like, I don't know if this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember the revelation that I had at the moment where we were discussing buttresses. And I was like, what does this got to do with drawing? <laughs> <laughs> and pre, you know, I was like, I don't want to, and it was heavy math, which I wasn't expecting. And I was like, oh, okay, you got to know how much weight this, you know, can bear. Weight and, bearing on yeah. boards and weight bearing on roofing. You have to know uh -huh. wind factors and, and your and girl. Everything. I was Girl. like, this is not what I want to do. <laughs> All I wanted to do was just to do the, you know, paint the so, pretty stuff. So, yeah. you know, I was blissfully ignorant for year one and two because our assignments was go find inspiration in a park and draw something and hand it in. Like, literally. I would drive around, go to Forest Hills, see some of the beautiful architecture and the buildings there, draft a building, draw it, use my little colored pencils, hand it in and get an A. That's like, it. That was me. Done. So, Done. Right. And then when we got to that buttresses talk and the math, and I was like, wait a minute, this is not what I wanted to do. Back and track. so, you know, I had to take a little step back. Yeah, because I found myself lagging in in wanting to be inspired about the the subject matters more. And, and I felt myself just kind of being drained. And I was like, you know what, this isn't for me. So I switched gears to business, which I always knew that I was going to do anyway. I switched gears to business, went from a four-year college to a two-year college and got my associates. Then from that associates program, I went to a four-year college and got my bachelor's, then went back there and got my master's. And then now I'm doing my doctorate. So now you're doing your doctorate, right. That's my journey. Girl. But you know what it is? I think it's just so essential that if, again, if you don't know what you're going to do, it's okay. It is okay because we are still figuring it out. We're still young. We're still relatively young. We're young. So we have the opportunity. We have the chances to do those things. And I think... That is just so important. And it highlights Women's History Month. And I just want to take a, just a quick step into how other women of color and other women that have influenced Women's History Month. So I just want to take a dive in and talk about this amazing person, 
So the first person I want to talk about is Mammy Phillips Clark. Now, she was the first Black woman to receive a degree from Columbia University. So that in itself, it was such a first, such a, an amazing accomplishment on its own, because let alone you're a woman, let alone you're an African-American woman, and you graduated from Columbia. So that in itself was just an accomplishment on its own. And she worked closely with her husband on what they call the research of the doll test. Now, if you guys are not too familiar about the doll test, this was something that was uh, instrumental to the Brown versus education case. Now, the doll test itself was just a demonstration of how the doll is a representation of themselves. So the darker skin doll represented a person of color and obviously a lighter skin was a, a lighter person. So there was just random tests of little children and they would usually point to the darker doll and they would say that doll looks ugly or that doll looks like this or this is not the pretty doll. And again, this is how they're self-conscious and how they think of themselves was already like pre entered into their heads already and they're little they're not they're not our age they're not 20 18 these are little kids that are already seeing themselves not being special because they are different so with this research it helped open the eyes to say what can we do for our children to make sure that they are understanding that they are are of worth that they are not just a color they are more than just one thing so again, that's how it comes into mental health. It comes into counseling. It comes into information. A lot of it comes down to information. So highlighting Women's History Month, there are so many influential women. And we can talk all day, <laughs> all day about the amazing females that have been essential to moving forward in this progression of how women operate in the world. But I just wanted to highlight her because she was just an amazing. I sat down, I read a little bit about the background. And I remember doing this in one of my psychology classes. And I thought that, oh, man, I didn't even realize how essential this was until reading more about just the conscious of young kids now. And a lot of it, it streamed back to COVID. So I know I keep bringing up COVID. COVID is the bad word. But what happens is a lot of the self-depredation and a lot of the self-consciousness has now applied through behind the screen. So when we think about that, it's just like, how is that so, it's so sad that these are the things that are happening now, because now a lot of the children are not suffering from anxiety. A lot of the children are suffering from social isolation. A lot of them are suffering from mental health. There's not, they might not have the support that they have at home. So looking at this as an example and progressing forward from there, it's just, I just saw the mirror imaging and I was like, this is, this happened 60 years ago and look what's happening now. A lot of their self-consciousness and their self-worth is now reduced because of something else that was predicated for them. I just want to think about what is your understanding of the case and what is your understanding of how females, not just females, but just people in general, how do they feel about how their self-worth is seen only because of the color of their skin? I want to say that irrespective of the circumstances that are happening, I think that because of what's happened during the pandemic, there's more heightened eyes and ears and understanding and awareness about what's going on. But the things that have been going on have have been happening from the time of this study, right? Right. And so now it's just more eyes and ears and understanding and revelations happening about it. And then we're working towards educating ourselves and understanding what's going on and trying to move forward in more diverse and equitable and in inclusive spaces. And so when I think about the study, I think it was obviously just representation, right? So representation matters. And so as a young Black child in that era, they've only seen their, themselves as less than, right? Portrayed on TV, mimicked and ridiculed, Blackface, like those are the ads and things that they're seeing. Parents having jobs that were of not 
in the same um, caliber as other white counterparts and things like that. Right, sort. white, uh, blue collar or white collar, however. Right, right, redlining and zoning and things like that. So we're, all of us were in slums and we're all... We're, so there, the portrayal of what was good and bad re- resulted into color, right? So if you think about it, when you think of something that's scary and bad, you think of something that's dark and black. Right. And when you think of something that's good, it's a white light. It's the light. You know? mm-hmm. Right. Right. So think about this. Um, Casper, the friendly ghost. He's a ghost. He's supposed to be dark and morbid. <laughs> right. But he's friendly because he's white. white. <laughs> right. It's like a it's a, it's a catch 22 almost, but it's it's representation. It's how we're portrayed. It's that it's biases. It's things that we are only looked to 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 be seen in one category, in one realm. And then that is portrayed onto our children. And and that is then passed on and passed on. So I think- Generation to generation. Right, right. I think this reawakening that's happening now is good because it's putting more eyes on it and it's it's focusing more on on the struggles that we have to deal with as women and as people of color and, and highlighting it because it almost seems like Others have been oblivious to what we have mm. dialed down and kind of put on a mask to make others feel comfortable without being our whole self. Mm. And so I think what's great about it is that we're learning how to be comfortable with our own selves and be unapologetic about how we are, our culture, our sayings, our slangs, our being, right? And we're just saying, well, this is how you need to take me. Right. And take me as I am. Take me as I am. Right. And then if you don't understand what who I am or what I am, why I look at things this way, then you need to educate yourself. Right. Because or ask you know, questions. Or ask questions. Ask yeah. questions. I right. mean, right. You, I mean, you can ask a question. I mean, it's not a yes or no answer. But if you ask question, that tells me that you are not only interested in what I have to say, that you are like. You're trying to understand where I'm coming from. Right. But here's also the caveat. Because some Uh-oh. are because some are just ignorant, right? And and That's where oblivious to, comes in again. And choose not to understand our perspective and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, well, this this is how I'm sharing to you of my experience. If you choose not to validate my experience to an understanding that's beneficial to you then you're not doing me any help. You're, by not, doing, you're not doing any service then, to me. Right. And then I'm like, well, maybe don't ask me no questions. Do <laughs> your own okay? we'll Do stand your over own there in the job. corner. <laughs> right. Because it's not my job to educate you. I, it, it's my, it's, I feel like it's my job if I want to help you come to an understanding. But it's optional, right? <laughs> it's optional. And because you have to deal with me every day, and I have to deal with you every day. Let's come to a common ground of how we're going to deal with each other. Right. And I'm going to tell you what I'm comfortable with. And you can tell me what you're comfortable with if you want. <laughs> so, that, that's it. Yeah. That's all you can. That's all you can hope for. And it's so it's so essential that you bring up the word representation. So, Marilyn, if you want to you know, jump right in and tell us a little bit on your understanding of how this doll test is still mirroring how things are happening still to today. It's mm-hmm. happened so long ago. It's so amazing. It's like, oh my God. Oh, Maya, it, that was, that was, incredible. that was phenomenal. I don't Maya. Know if I want to go after that, but I will try. Um, I will say, as you said, the doll test was decades ago and we still see remnants of it every day, all day. And in education, you see it myself, you get the imposter syndrome, you go into a predominantly white campus or institution, and you don't feel like you belong, you feel like an outcast, and you really have to find a way to feel comfortable, or to feel comfortable being uncomfortable in that space. And it's, it's really hard. And when you're I would say when you're in that type of community, it can be difficult to handle because as Maya said, representation does matter. And when you don't feel like you're on the same foundation as your other peers, because you grew up differently, because you grew up in a different environment, you grew up in a different community, it it really takes a toll mentally, emotionally, and you start questioning your own abilities. And what's happened in education, and it's been going on for a very long time. 
And as you stated before, Stephanie, mental health is key in education. And I think within the past 10 years, we've made a revolution with it. But a lot of this impacts the students of color. It impacts their mental health. It impacts their day to day. And they try to seek support. And it depends on the institution if they actually have individuals that can support students. Do they have counselors of color? When students are trying to feel a connection or trying to seek support, are they going to be able to walk into a room and be able to speak to someone who they feel understands them? And I think a lot of institutions have made that change, but and have made the steps to to complete that so that students feel represented, but it's, it's not enough. It's still a work um, in progress, right? It's, yeah. it's still a work in progress. It's still a work in progress, but I would say now after during COVID, we saw the we saw that not everyone's on the same footing. You saw the pictures of students sitting outside of a Taco Bell just trying to use their Wi-Fi so they can do their homework or attend class. And a lot of those pictures were pictures of, of kids of color who were trying to just get their education and trying to go work out the obstacles that they had to just to be able to turn in their homework. And that's stressful for these kids. And you really see the disparities with everything. And how, how does that not impact you? How, how does, does that, that not that impact? Not, yep. How does it yeah. not impact you? How does Absolutely. that not impact you? That How does that not impact you as a child? How does that impact you as a parent, as a sibling, to having to see this and see the struggle every day? And that hurts. It, it really affects you personally. Yes, yes, we can all overcome and become better, but we also have to carry that on our backs every day. So just like the doll test, it all impacts us. It, we really carry. I'm 38 years old and I still carry a lot of the obstacles that I had to go through. Girl. Everything that I had to help my parents through, all of that is still in me. And I still feel like I don't belong half of the time. But, you know, you force yourself in a room and you make yourself, you, you like Maya said, you become a different version of yourself to be able to make yourself palatable. But you do it because that's the only way you can succeed. And, and it's once just, you're in a room, you can be yourself and you'd be like, kick me out. Let's see what happens. Right, exactly. Let's yeah. see how this happens. But it, it's hard. And the doll test was a great way to demonstrate how it impacts kids. But, you know, we still, those kids grow up and become they grow people. up. Yep. And they then up. those insecurities go into their children. And it's unfortunately, the ind it's individuals who have to actually work through the trauma, through the stressors to be able to break that generational hold that we pass on to our, to our children. And it's so strange, not strange, but I've been reading so much research that it is ingrained genetically in our DNA. So mm -hmm. if you have any, any doubts or any um, past trauma, it can literally be encoded into your DNA and it's now a generational upbringing. It, it was such an interesting, I'm going to, I'm going to post that onto the podcast as well and put a little bit more of information about that research, but it can be literally ingrained in your DNA. Now think about it. Now that we're essentially, we are trying to move forward. And as Maya and Marilyn has put it so eloquently, we have to keep striving for representation. So this is why we're going to take it to the next segment, talking about books, movies, and shows. So along with Moomin's History Month, we're focusing on strong female leads. So I know that there has been so many amazing shows that we all can't get to it. I know that. But if there's anything that we want the listeners to know, we want you to know that if you are interested or if you want us to talk about any book or any movie or any show and just have like a good old time with it, email me, text me, send me all the information and we can definitely talk about that because we want to keep this book club coming. We want to keep it going. We want to at least do this at least once a month and just have a, a, a real conversation. It's just like, this is us trying to figure out what we want to do and what makes us smile because we always have to do what? Something for our mental health. And sometimes reading a book, listening to music, going, doing a little bit of exercise, go taking that run, go taking a mental break, go taking that vacation. All these little things that everybody takes little time to themselves is just so essential. So if you sink in and you Netflix and chill for a little bit and you forget all the other stuff that's going on, it is essential for your health. Absolutely. And I would like to just jump in and talk about maybe one or two shows. So who would like to lead off 
on one of the shows that they've been watching for the month of March? I can. I think we could all talk about some of the shows. I know uh, we've all seen Insecure. Yes, um, yes, yes. And so I, I feel like definitely there are leading women in the show and leading men because there's always Team Lawrence, right? Team La- <laughs> Team Lawrence. <laughs> Well, yes, yes. I think the show is really, really great. You know, at first I didn't like Insecure because I thought it was a little too comic-y and too... Um... Explain, because I felt the same way. Can you explain thought... what you meant? Because so, like, I felt I the really... same way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I honestly thought the acting was bad the first time. Yes! I saw it. Yes! And I thought... I was like, this is what y'all are raving about? And I'm like, I guess... And it was like, nah, it's really good. I, You know, let it grow on you. And so then I started watching a little more. I was like, oh, it's it's a Black show. Oh, they're actually doing this. And, then, <laughs> you know, my and I was like, oh, okay, this is what's supposed to be happening. <laughs> and it was like, it was... I was so in shock of how raw they're relating to our struggles and so i was like and and i thought that was just bad acting because i'm like you know what you be doing that on tv like this is hbo what are y'all doing what are y'all so, doing exactly that's, that's exactly what i was so, thinking you know, i watched i watched you know and this is when this is back in the day when we used to have watch parties before before that i was at a, some friend's house and they had the popcorn flowing and drinks flowing and when we was watching this thing i was like this is not it this is not it. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, okay, I've done watch all episodes. I didn't, I didn't even have to binge. I would go home and get get right on those episodes. And, and what's great about it is when you binge in or when the new episode releases, it usually gets released like that midnight hour. Ooh, I was up at midnight watching that show. Waiting, just waiting. <laughs> yeah. So I love, love, love Insecure. And I love how the strong leads have evolved. I think there's a story about evolution in a lot of the characters. In Molly's character, in Issa's character, like there's this evolution of growing. And I, I love that, it, it, especially within the finale. Like, everyone has kind of grown into their own. Everyone has kind of recognized their faults and, and recognized their strengths and then kind of grown into that and understanding that the mistakes that they've made before are okay and going into this space of learning. So I, I love that kind of journey that the characters have been on. And you know what's so funny? Like, when I first watched it, I was in I was being indecisive between watching insecure or euphoria so a lot of people were telling me you should watch euphoria because it talks a lot about mental health and it was just like something i wanted to talk about it and then we were discussing it in class and i was just like ah but then as i started going into the season i was like yo she's actually kind of funny and i'm like but my take on it is that i didn't relate on many levels and i'll tell you right i'll tell you why I, for one, I was never on the dating scene. I literally met my husband when I was in college, when I was 18, and I have been with him ever since. I've never been with anybody else. I'm just throwing it out there because that's just me. It's just a wholesome little me. But I, it was on that level, I couldn't relate. Because I don't, especially on Molly's part, I mean, as an intelligent lawyer, and I was just like, she is just so badass. I'm like, she is such a great character. But I'm just like, yeah, you're in the bed a little too much for me. And I was just like, I can't relate. But then again, this is me understanding and looking at from a different perspective. But like, she's a strong female lead, point blank. So I was just like, I was in awe of all the actors in there and especially Issa Rae, who's the producer and the writer. And she's like all these things behind that. I'm like, how is she making this work? And it's just like, you just do it when you are that talented. Like you could get away with shit like that. <laughs> it's just like, but that, that was on the take on me. But as progressing and watching the seasons, I was just like, this is a freaking amazing show. It was like, this is so good. Team Lawrence. There we go. <laughs> You know what I think is really good to note as well is that opportunities exist as well. And Issa started with her sketch show on YouTube. And it's, it's a good journey to show from where she started and to just keep pushing as well. And I believe her journey, I believe she pitched a lot of different things to a lot of different companies and was turned down. And so it just shows you how, how we get not taken advantage of, but downplayed a lot. 
with our talents as black and brown people. As women, you know, right from me. It's a real good testament about sticking to your guns and being authentic in yourself and showing that hard work does pay off. And consistency is, is super key. Consistency, think, persistency. Because... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think of that. I think of, I think of Shonda Rhimes. I think of her many different ventures that she's done. How to Get Away with Murder. She was also, she just did Inventing Anna as well. So mm -hmm. she has been busy. Yeah, and she did the that hospital one. I can't remember. Um, what's the name of that one? Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy, Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Right? Grey's Anatomy. Right? yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So, like, she also did um, Bridgerton. She also she did Bridgerton, too, right? Like, See? See? We're now. just she dropping them. <laughs> like, Shonda Land is yes. everywhere. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And and I don't know if you remember there was a, a news story about about Shonda how she was with one um, network and the acts was she had family members coming in and she asked for additional tickets to Disneyland at the time and they told her no no I remember that right. yes yeah. and, I remember that said, story she said oh okay. <laughs> and then went left. You said, okay. And so it's the little things that matter because it's that part of you're not meeting me at my need, at my most simplest need. Because what was it to give her two extra tickets? Nothing. Three tickets. Nothing. To Disneyland. It was nothing. The, the network owns and has a relationship with them. It was nothing for you. But you wanted to pull card and be a superior in that moment. And now look. But she bought them so much money. Like she exactly. literally exactly. Like brought up the ratings in ABC. Like she exactly. did. Like she made ABC again because they had That's lost it. their footing so for so long. Not to knock on ABC, somebody. but what were they doing? They had these stupid game shows on with people getting hit in the face with these the balls. And I was just like, what are they doing? Say, ABC wasn't lit on from when we was in high school. No, yeah. because they had TGIF. Exactly. exactly. And so mm -hmm. now as adults, and we're going to back to watch ABC, that was it. Listen, I was all, yeah. how to get away with all of those. It was that kind of um episode that kind of happened with her and her and that former network that kind of just solidified the fact that even though you've done this much for somebody, somebody's still gonna look at you as this little. And this color skin <laughs> and this gender, right? And so it really kind of boggles my mind because I'm wondering what that person was thinking as they tried to pull rank and pull cards on this person, um, on Shonda Ryan. Maybe they, I, I'm trying to remember, did it, did he have any indication that he knew who she was? Or I no? don't know. And I don't know that it was a he that did that as well. I could, right, right. I don't want to assume that either. I'm just saying. Right, right, right. I don't know. But of course you know, because you would know that this person is who they are, and they was just they were asking a, a simple ask, and it's that part of humility that kind of sets everyone else apart as well. Because I think unless you've been through some things, and as children of immigrants, we done been through some things. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, Say know, less, fam. <laughs> There, there, there's a little bit of humbleness in us, but we also have that poise and that snapback as well because of our upbringing and, and, and because of our color, right? We have tougher and harder skin and we, we have to be um, in different spaces uh, like a chameleon just to assimilate almost. So Moment. annoying. It's so annoying yeah. be because as for you, Marilyn, you've been in college where I'm going to assume not many people of color. Uh, can I just yes. assume that? Okay. No, you're, so you're I'm just throwing right. that out there. For myself mm -hmm. and Maya, we were in a field where it was men dominated. It was mm -hmm. men dominated. We were trying yeah. to get into engineering and architecture. And it's, again, STEM now is the place to be. And the women are excelling in STEM now. And that mm -hmm. is the whole goal. The whole goal is, again, we want to be represented in all realms, whether it's in music, whether it's in directing, or if it's in writing, in journalism, in medicine, in, in any type of form, we need to continue to have that representation. So it's just so essential that with this whole incident with Shonda, um, with Shonda Rhimes, I was just like, how does that even happen? And I'm like, well, here we go. Another example of how, so it's just like, it's always, we're always having a uphill battle. It's just like, come on guys. Like we're, it's 2022. We have been through it. COVID's been around since 2020. Things have not changed since then. 
What, what, what are we doing any differently? We're not doing anything differently. It's just we have less dollar, less money to <laughs> move around and shuffle. And it's just like now everything else is just that so much harder. So much harder. Unnecessarily. Unnecessarily. Well, I think for women, it's there's for women in general, there's always someone trying to put you in your place. Always. At work. You go to take your car in and they're trying to put you in your place when you know, when you actually sometimes know what you're talking about. You go into a male dominated area, they're putting your place, your boss puts you in your place. And then as a woman of color, people always second guess. They completely second guess. I've I've been at different positions where I they tell me to do something and I know they're testing me to make sure that I'm smart. I'm like, mm-hmm. you want to see how smart I am? Okay, let me do okay. it. And then blow it out the water. And I'm like, how many times do I have to do this? And every time I talk about trying to go into a new field or going to a new job, I agree, that's what I'm going to have to do because it comes with going into a different organization. It does. People always want to test you, see how smart you are, see how much of a competition you're going to be. And then they're going to try to figure out how to put you in your place. Wow. That's, yeah. that's deep. That's deep. I think with me and my field in business, finance is finance. Numbers are numbers. Numbers are numbers, yep. Right. One plus one is always going to equal two, right? But I think in finance, it's it's definitely, I feel like it's a mixed field. It's definitely where executive roles and C-suite members are more male. Male, yeah, for sure, for sure. Most CPAs are male. And then as far as like bookkeepers and things of that sort, that's more female. And it's so weird because it's like the hierarchy of the level of executive, there's that ceiling that women are kind of capped at almost. And there are great women in, in, in the finance space, like Sonda Ducking. So she's was CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, and now she's moved on and become CEO of another, another company. So there are great women in the space that are making strides. And I feel like, it, like you said, Marilyn, there is this that we kind of have to go through as, as like the color, testing, as testing, one, two, three. But just to not even fit in, but to almost like prove your worth. And it's annoying. And I think what this pandemic has actually done, for me at least, I'm not proving nothing to nobody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we, we done been through a whole pandemic. We have had to self-soothe because we weren't able to go and visit other people. Yeah. And therefore our anxiety levels have been high. Most people, I feel like our in our generation, we weren't taught about we weren't taught about no. things that um affect us that might be happening. We were just told to suck it up. And, and do it and go. Don't worry about it. That's Don't nothing. worry about it. Just do it and go and put it on the back burner. Yeah. And the, the the weight of that back burner carrying on you while you're trying to just function gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And, heavier. and, heavier. Mm-hmm. and so now, you know, with this pandemic and with the revelation of things happening and, and open minds and open ears, now it's more relevant to be conscious of the things that are triggers to us. Now it's like bring to the forefront now. Because now right. it's like, hear me, this is what I am saying. Are you understanding the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? Right, 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 right. And I think it's it's great for our generation because we're actually able to recognize what's happening. And now we can change that level of generational um, standard yes. that we passed down from us, from our parents, because they were just taught to suck it up and go, especially as women, especially as, as women, as women yep. of color, we're taught to be strong women. We're taught to just be strong, no matter what's mm-hmm. going on. We're just no matter what's strong. going on. Yup. And, and I think, I don't think that's something of a, of a bad thing. I, I think that it just makes us that more resilient because we've been taught, Hey, listen, you got to do this, this, and make sure you have this in place and things like that. But again, it, a lot of that pressure And a lot of that weight on the, we have the weight of the world on our shoulders. So for me personally, it's just like, I feel like if I'm not doing this and I'm not doing great and I have like all these bad thoughts in my head and it's just like, I know that I got to one point where it's like, I need to figure out what's going on and I need help. And I think me recognizing that was not detrimental. I think it was a great thing that I was able to do that and talking and doing therapy and finding other means of coping with what I was feeling. And I, and I kind of drowned myself in trying to reach out. I think Mm -hmm. that as women, we, it's so important that we have to reach out, look for support 
and look mm-hmm. to other means of just like, listen, I'm having a problem. Can you hear me out? <laughs> Cause of venting. Like a lot of people right. might think that it's complaining, but it's like, no, like, listen to what I'm saying. Like, really, this is something that's bothering me. And I really just need somebody to talk to. Right. And it, it's so important that it, as women and people in general, but it's just so more important. I know women just, we just feel everything. Like us ladies, we just feel everything. <laughs> right, right. And you know what? Being told to be strong and having strength are two different things. Two different yes. things. Right? Exactly. And so yep. if we're always told to be strong, then we're always just saying, okay, well then in this situation, I just have to be strong and forget mm-hmm. everything else. When rather, you know, having strength is actually just having strength and the courage to be in this situation. Sometimes being strong is just waking up. <laughs> and, yeah. and wanting to take on the day because you never know what your anxiety might tell you that you can't do it. And like, like, like I think Marilyn brought up before, like imposter syndrome that that's happening in, in, in what she sees in, in students at, in her profession. As adults, we wake up with imposter syndrome a lot. And when we're put into these situations where we have to prove ourselves or live up to a certain standard, then the anxiety of imposter syndrome can also come there as well. And then that thought of, oh, I gotta be strong and I gotta do this. So that can be overwhelming as well. I think that's what we're learning to do is have strength rather than be strong. Mm-hmm. You, well, you, you, you bring up an, an excellent point about that, Maya. Just breaking it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we've been taught to be strong and we think about it. And I, like, it's, you also have to correct yourself. Like I always have, I'm like, no, I need to suck it up and keep going. And then I need to like, I actually have to internally think about that and be like, no, you can't think like this anymore. You've been thinking like this for the past 38 years of your life. You have to like convince yourself and and retrain your mind on how to really handle the stressors of life. Right. How are you going to deal with it? Yes, I'm going to actually ask someone to help me. For me, that's extremely hard. I hate asking people for help. Girl. I don't like it. <laughs> I hate it. Girl. Because it's a sign me. of weakness. It's a it sign is. of weakness. And we were, and, and, that's and, we were taught, and we were taught that. We were taught to not ask anyone for help. Mm-hmm. Literally, that's what my mom would tell me. Don't ask anyone for help because they will, they will want something in return from you. Yes. That, that, that's your what, we grew up, what we grew up on but it's okay to understand that some things you're not able to do and that you need we weren't taught that way we were just taught figure it out yeah. and as adults in in our corporate worlds now i find myself doing work and figuring it out and that's great if you have a logistic mind or you have a figure it out mentality and you like solving puzzles that's cool but if you're not that then you're you're going to be stuck because mm-hmm. you think that you can't ask for help because you're you've been ingrained to fig to just figure it out and rather than actually lend open up yourself to actually receive the help you're just sitting there stuck trying to figure it out exactly and then you just stress yourself out and then you get on the verge of wanting to just, just be done with it all. Like, I just don't want to, I don't want to work. I don't want to do this. I just want to, just want to just be in my bed or I don't just want to close myself off to the world. I need that time to decompress. And it's not, that's always great, but it's also not a great response to stress. The stress will always be there. Life is, life is stressful. You know, life is just, stress. we've been stressed out since we were kids, right? Like we were stressed <laughs> out about getting fed. We were stressed out about a toy. We were stressed out about like being liked in school. We were stressed out when we, we actually had to start doing tests. We were stressed out about that. And it's been ongoing since then. The thing is, is that we have to retrain our minds. And, and actually that's kind of the thing that I love about sometimes, and I wasn't really big into social media in like a few years ago, but that's kind of like what I like watching, like those videos where you see these younger people really trying to talk about how they're retraining their minds or things that they're focusing on to be able to deal with their stressors, own their stress, but also figure out, also know that it's okay to be stressed out. It's okay to self-soothe or find ways to cope. That's not something that was around when, when we were no, young. No, it wasn't. You know, we you were just taught to deal with it. Right. Well, you're not doing well in school. Figure it out. Figure like, it out. <laughs> you can't, like, the trains aren't working. You better walk your walk, way to school. Walk, walk. Figure it out. <laughs> exactly. Take two buses. You're going to have to, you're gonna, you will have to figure it out. But the thing is, like, I think that just makes us that more resourceful. <laughs> no, it does. And that's the pro of it, right? Like, right. That's that the pro the of it. Generation. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I see that at 
and I had this conversation with someone where they were saying that their their kids aren't as critical thinkers as they are. And I'm like, because you had a whole completely different upbringing. Like you translated for your parents. You had to go to these big important meetings and appointments and doctors. And you as a child, as a teenager were, you know, translating these things to your, you were taking on certain things that were slight adultish for your parents, which helps you and pushed you to be more of a critical thinker. And two, your parents weren't going to be there, like inspecting your homework and doing, that was all on you. Oh yeah. From the moment you started your checking your homework. Me, I'm like looking at homework like this. I'm like, this homework is ridiculous. <laughs> exactly. So now these like, kids are actually like the generation's different. They're getting different exposures because parents are, are switching to what they wanted when they were kids or what they felt was going to help them. So of course they're developing differently, which is which has pros and cons too. Absolutely. You know? so absolutely. It, absolutely. Every generation, every way that we're bringing everyone up, it's it has pros and cons. But as I said, as you said, Stephanie, it's it's part of us being resourceful and finding each other, but it's also why my 38 year old self is retraining her mind to actually let go of work and it's not think of, oh man, I'm going to have like 10 things to do tomorrow. So maybe I should stay late to like do all this work and then get home and know I'm going to have to be at work less than eight hours. Like nobody wants that. Like no. that sucks. That's, you know? see, that's why we're sisters because I was literally about to say the same thing. You just <laughs> Right out you of took my the mouth. words right out of my yeah. mouth. <laughs> I was like, you know, I, I was just saying that uh, I've been in corporate for forever, literally over 20 years, right? And I felt like as a woman, and honestly, in some, in most places that I've been the youngest person there. And so there's already another thing. Like uh, so age is always something else. Ageism, girl, don't even get me started. <laughs> right, right. So I'm the youngest person. They, they downplay me. They think that I'm not there. or they're at testing the you. Right. And then I show them that and they're like, oh, she can keep up. And that's that. But I felt like I always had to overwork myself and I was always the, the last person there first um, person always, to show up <laughs> the last well, one to I, leave I, I, I wouldn't go that far you know, <laughs> I mean, y'all know me with time so. the time oh, Maya <laughs> but, but but okay my work was done okay but um, <laughs> but what I would say is that like 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 Marilyn was saying I, I felt like I had a list of things to do every day and then if I didn't get through that list I would stay there late overnight sometimes and just Guilty. do work and the thing is like Guilty. anybody in finance can tell you sometimes finance just takes on a mind of it so sometimes you're late there sometimes it's slow days, sometimes it's late days, but closing out a month and closing out a year is just nightmarish. Audits and things like that. You, you're doing a lot of work. And I, I found myself staying late at work a lot. And it, I felt like it was almost a luxury because I didn't have any children. And so I was coming home to, I didn't have anybody to answer to as well. So I was, it was okay for me to do that. But then after the pandemic, I was like, what was I doing? Like, what was I doing? And it was just while becoming an entrepreneur and kind of making my own schedule, I felt that freedom in 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 creating my own lane and creating my own path to success. And after looking back at all the things that I was doing in the corporate world, just to kind of fit in and assimilate and 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 keep up, it just seemed so asinine. Asinine. Oh, I was just gonna say, yo. Like, it was just like. It was just like, this is what I used to do? Like, like for what? And the thing was, it was because I didn't, I wanted my work to speak for me. And I wanted to make sure that this was done and they was, that my name meant something. And while all in the while, I could have been fired. They could have replaced me easily. God forbid I got hurt. I had surgery and I was on, reco I was in recovery and I was working in my bed. Like, I did not take off. <laughs> like six weeks, I was home. Approving my transfers, doing purchase Girl. orders, and doing payroll from my bed. Okay. And I think okay. that, and it's, no. just, it's just so weird. I feel like we have been programmed to just be workhorses. And in a sense where we're even scared to call out and take our sleep <laughs> time and leave. And oh, it's yeah. just like... You know what? I'm like, and 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 to the point where it's like, there's just going to be work on top of work on top of work. And if I take off, then I'm not going to get it done. And somebody's going to do this. And, and I'm like, well, what in the hell? As a person who kind of, you know, 
needed my days. I I wouldn't feel that I came to a point where I was when, when I was still in the corporate world where I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna be ashamed of taking a sick day. If I'm and and, and I'm gonna call out and not feel bad about it. And some of my colleagues were like, oh yeah, I'm not feeling good, but I'm gonna go and I'm like, why? Why? You are, you might have the flu, baby girl. Like, Stay <laughs> you want to bring that to the office? No. Yeah, but there's so much work to do. I'm like, that work is still going to be there tomorrow. It's still going to be there that when you get back. still going to be there tomorrow, and someone else will figure it out and how, and how to do it. And so I, I remember just struggling because trying to make it into work while I'm in pain, you know, and 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 feeling like I needed to be there because the work was going to be there for me and I needed to make sure that my work spoke for myself. Now, my retraining myself, like like Marilyn said, retraining myself in 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 being more cognizant and understanding my worth and building that kind of work life balance i don't i call out i take my days and i'm back in the corporate world and i find myself kind of slowly slipping back into that mentality creeping that was back before. to it creeping back yeah, to that like even today I, I stayed there later and didn't take a lunch break and i was like what am i doing i had to kind of recall myself. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, I'm leaving and it's dark outside. Wait, mm. wait. This is not this is not the start that I wanted to do. I'm already thinking of ways on how to reprogram myself and create and kind of edit and kind of edit, right? Right, right. Like I want to program. I want an agenda. I want to this is what I should be doing at this time, this time, this time. And then when I look at the clock, okay, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing at this time. But yeah, I'm already thinking of the next work week and thinking of what I can do to make it more sane <laughs> for me and right right for me you know, because I realized the way that I was operating wasn't healthy it was just me trying to operate but it was normal for you, you but that's what I'm saying it's normal. normal for years for me for years yeah. same for years year. for me. it was normal yeah. for you to me yeah. and then after this pandemic I realized how stupid it was <laughs> you know what I, I always said this not to interrupt you but I always thought I've always thought of it like I'm looking for a stamp of approval while leaving my stamp on it that was like the thing that I kept on saying to myself it's like I'm trying to prove myself on a daily basis to make sure that you approve of me and I'm doing what I need to do to make sure that you recognize me and I'm just like I, I can't keep up <laughs> But think about it. It's been ingrained in us since we were kids. You work hard, you produce stuff. Like you said before, Stephanie, where's the A? Where's the A plus? I brought all my A plus. My dad's Where like, is where's it? the A plus plus? That where is it? Exist. It don't exist. Where, where is it? <laughs> you got to show it to them. Yeah, I got to show it to them. Look, I'm doing well. I am doing okay. Is but it? it's been ingrained in us since we were children. Education teaches us to work hard, to grind for eight hours, and like go home and do more work after you just did eight hours, right? So then we go into the corporate world and it's the same thing. Right. They push you, push you, push you, and they make you, you have to do all this work and you have to excel. And when you excel, here's more work. You can handle this. You can handle you're, it. You're above average. You're yeah, above average. You you're doing great. Keep it going. And then you don't even realize how much of a toll it takes on you, on your body, on your vacations. I have done work while I've been in Hawaii, while I was in Mexico, all different times. I had taken phone calls. Why am I taking a phone call on the beach? I don't even get paid that much to be able to take phone calls Girl. on the beach. Girl. If, if I'm this important, pay Talk me more. If Girl. Pay me more if I'm this important. <laughs> if you, I cannot take a whole five days off then pay me more. That was something that I realized as well. I gave my job too much access to. Even, you know what it was? Because I was um, in an international company, the time we I dealt with a lot of time zones, and I would have this severe anxiety as I wake up every morning because I run to my phone, have to check my phone and check the emails because they've already done their work day in in the other time zone, and so as soon as I wake up, I have to respond to their stuff while still getting my stuff done. So I figured, let me check my emails in the morning so I could know what my day is going to be like. And that would give me anxiety because then I'm sitting up in my bed responding to emails from my <laughs> phone that my job don't even pay for. And I'm trying to get work done and respond to, 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 to people before I even started and clocked in to my day. For the day. And I, I realized that was way too much access that I'm willing to give to a company that didn't really treat me 
well enough or took into consideration my well-being or my mental health. And I stopped, I deleted all the apps on my phone that had to do anything with my job. And therefore, if I wasn't in the office, it was not getting done. It was not getting done. (laughs) Not applicable. Can, can I approve things or can I check my messages or things? And I, I realized that I had to retrain them too because they all had my personal phone number and was texting me and WhatsApping me and stuff like that. I wasn't responding to them until I got in the office. And then you know what I also did? I have, I have two phones. I have my personal phone and then I have a business phone. I started to put my business phone number on my resume. Now my jobs have my business line and I cut that thing off. I don't respond to this phone at, until work hours. And I don't even, I don't have my emails on it or nothing. I don't even, I don't even um, have my work um, emails or anything that like on my personal computer. I don't want that. I'm like, if you want me to work from home then supply me with a laptop and your secure network so that I could do it. because. You're not going to blame me if something gets infiltrated into your network. Or any breach or anything I, like using, that. Because I'm using my Xfinity Wi-Fi at my house that I pay for. <laughs> you, know? So, you know? So things like that where I'm like, like there's different levels of expectations that they take for granted as an employee, whereas I need to give them expectations of my commitment to them as well. And my commitment to them is what we listed in these job duties right here from the time that you said we start until mm-hmm. the time that we and so I'm trying to learn to and, and listen it, this is all a growing and learning process because I'm still, like you said we're, we're in our we're in our late 30s and we are still learning and growing every this single day for me but knowing that now and having this mindset and understanding what I, I will and will not accept has allows me to be a better um steward of my time, allows me to be a better employee, and allows me to keep my work-life balance intact and my mental health. And you know what it is, too? It's like thinking about that, how does that apply in through all realms of workforce, right? When we think about the workforce, right? How can we implement or be assertive without being called the bitch or being called something else. It's like, I'm being assertive about what I want and what I will tolerate and what I will not tolerate. Right. So then again, playing that role in being a female and being in a male dominated industry or in how, however that is, if it's in math, if it's in science and in, in, in architecture, however it is in education, it's always something that I always look back at and I was like, I don't have to work this hard. <laughs> Why do I have to keep working this hard? Again, it, it applies like when we think about these amazing women that are behind the scenes doing this amazing work, all these amazing women that are, are writers and, and producers and doing all these amazing things. Mammy Philip Clark, another individual that went ahead and started going to school and, and doing all these amazing things and bringing forth a, 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 a case of the doll test that made a life changing decision on a Supreme Court case. And so those are the things that as women, as females, we have to continue and strive to keep fighting. But I hate that I have to keep fighting. <laughs> I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of it. But it's just, it's a, this, that is an unfortunate, I don't know, it after was. effect. Yeah, it's just, it is what it is. Part of it is that we just have to recognize that in any space, we we may be that bitch. We may be somebody because I have to tell people no. Oh, well. You know, like, yeah, I'm going to walk out of room and you're probably going to call me a bitch. But that's the J-O-B. Like, I get to say no. And I own it. I'm like, I know people talk about me. I know people say this, that. But I'm doing my job. At I don't come in. I don't cuss anybody out. I don't catch day. attitude. I don't flip anybody off. I'm doing my job. And if you can't take that, then that's not my fault. Yeah. I have to take it and eat it when people tell me no and make my life harder. But I'm not, oh, that dude's an asshole or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But if people want to take it that way, then you take it that way. As long as my check is in my account and I will be at work and I will be that person who says no. The day that money does not show up in my account is the day that I don't care. I don't happens. show up. I don't facts. show up. Facts, facts. facts. I, I felt that on every level, sis. Because <laughs> I know I've been called a few days too. Just <laughs> you know, Girl. Having, having, you know, nonprofit experience and I know you in education as well. Like just having that experience 
experience and being in government and like there's pro I'm a big process person. I'm a big logistics person. And so if there's a, a way that is is around the process, then I'm gonna be like, well, no, we didn't do this, this, but this, 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 this is the process. And so if I gotta say no, sorry, I, I know I've been called some names behind my back. Maybe to my face sometimes. Maybe to your face. Just, I was going to say, maybe to your face too. Very subtly, but I'm so oblivious to it that I'm just here doing my job. <laughs> but yeah, I'm so, girl, I'm girl, so girl. busy being busy. Have you seen this meme that's like, if I'm not working, I'm sleeping. If I'm sleeping, I'm on in my business. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's just like, right. it's all applicable. It is all applicable. But ladies, I can't thank you enough for talking with me and just letting everybody know because this is the struggle. The struggle is real. <laughs> you know what it is? And I can't thank you enough for having this conversation with me and just highlighting like what it is. It's, I mean, it's out there. We just have to continue to strive and continue to push and continue to make sure that we're doing our best to make sure that our mental health is okay. We got to make sure our friend's mental health is okay. <laughs> and we have to keep doing things in a positive sense, whether we're doing fun things for ourselves, going on vacation, taking that mental break, reading a book, watching a show, Netflix is in chilling. So it's just a matter of just finding something that just gives us a little piece <laughs> Of mine, a little bit of, of happiness at that point. So I just want to thank you ladies for coming onto the podcast today and just having this, the most realist conversation and just being able to chat and just like highlight the amazing people we know in our lives. And I know that I'm so grateful you guys were able to come onto this podcast with me and just have a conversation. We're going to try to keep this up at least once a month catch up on everything, shows, music, books, and just life in general. I just want to thank Maya for coming in, girl. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, you coming on today. Marilyn, my girl, I'm so thankful that you guys were able to come and spend time with me today. Thank you. This was a pleasure. And oh my gosh, this was like the best thing that I've done in months. So thank you so much. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm so excited. I'm so glad you guys had a good time. So I just want to tell everybody you can follow Table for Four on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, and on Twitter at Table for Four. You can also find us on Apple on Google, Pocket Cast. You can find us on Amazon, Pandora, iHeartRadio. You can find us on all these great platforms because we are on every, everything that you can think of and find us wherever you listen to your podcast. This is Stephanie. And thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. And guys, you guys have a great night. Thank you so much, guys.